raised horses. And uh, even before we were invaded, uh, the cavalry came, came to our farm and requisitioned all the horses. And like I keep saying, I was always a nosy kid. I want to see what was going on. I was watching, you know, there I was watching bye-bye horses. And whose cavalry are we talking about? Oh, the Polish cavalry. So, so the Polish cavalry was taking these, not the Russians, not the Germans. Uh, no, 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 because, you know, Poland is invaded by Germany. That's how the World War II starts. But when Poland mobilized in response to the German threat, uh, Poland in 1939 wasn't so terribly motorized. So a lot depended on horsepower, and there was still a cavalry. Yeah, they needed we kind of forget that that's how it was, and of course it changes throughout the war. So. Um, the Germans are coming from the west to invade Poland, and the Russians are coming from the northeast to get their piece of Poland. What is going to happen with your family? Well, I do recall, see, the German invasion was long ways from us. So the first enemy to cross our doorstep were the Soviet Union forces. And one of the things that happened was my uncle was put on one of the lead tanks and given a ride all around the, the area. Well, everyone seemed to think he was a goner, but now they, they let him get off. Uh, it's a real threat in the sense that we are landowners. Therefore, we are capitalist pigs. Mind you, Soviet Union in those days was communist. Uh, capitalist pigs were not very liked, well liked. So, I'm trying to think how to keep it short and how to, what to tell you. Uh, but essentially, you're going to have a fear that they're going to take over your land. They might shoot or take away your brother and your dad, and we don't know what's going to happen to the women. Is that part of the threat and the concerns that we have now? Oh, heavens, yes. All right, and what are you going to do? Well, the first, first step was, I always say this with a little uh, disclaimer, but okay, the first step was for the men to take off to the woods, which left the women to face the Russian army. Uh, you know, my mother was fortunate. She was a very attractive woman, but... Uh, nobody seemed, at that time, nobody seemed to be interested in her. And I was like a five-year-old kid, so the two of us were pretty safe. But me, what happened was that the wagons pulled up on a rainy day, and all the furniture was removed out of our house. So the furniture went, and there was nothing left. Well, the handwriting on the wall is saying, that we had better get the heck out of here. So it gets complicated, but we do manage to avoid the threat of Siberia and all those other things by crossing over to, the Pol to Poland, which is occupied by Germany. And since we also had a home in Warsaw, well, that was a logical place to, to go to. So you do escape, you are a refugee, and you do escape 
to Warsaw. Right. And you're not trying to say to the audience that you had great love for the Germans either, but they seemed to be the lesser of two evil? Was Ex that? Exactly. I mean, both sides have invaded your homeland, so it isn't something that, we, that you are embracing or oh. other Polish people. No, no, no. <laughs> we didn't like either one of them. <laughs> Well, and I think we could all understand that. We would, I'm sure, if, if we were living there, we would feel exactly the same. So now you are in Warsaw, and it's controlled or ruled by the Nazis. Um, are they friendly? Absolutely not. Are they intimidating? Yes. So a young girl has real fear of these Nazi soldiers in their uniforms. Well, now it, it's hard to qualify this. You know, it's, uh, by this time I must be getting on to like six years old. As a kid, you know, I was protected from a lot of anxieties. My parents took good care of looking after me. But on the other hand, I was nosy. I was not blind, and I was not deaf. I was particularly good at listening to what the adults were saying. So the idea that uh, it's necessary to stay out from under the, uh, well, the SS and the Gestapo radar uh, is a real, real necessity. But you did, did you get out and play as a kid with oh, other kids? I mean, you didn't lose that freedom. No, but no. there is the fear of what could happen either by bad luck or they assume that you did something or your parents did something. Oh, absolutely. Okay. And what does your dad do? Well, I tried to tell you this ahead of time, but uh, everyone had to have an identity card. I'm not sure if the kids had to have one or not, but I know my parents had to have one. And the identity card had to stipulate that, you know, you had some form of gainful employment. Uh, how you get gainful employment if you don't have a particular trade, you're displaced from your home and you have an enemy occupying your country, it's a little, problematic, but okay, my dad got a nominal job at an estate doing all kinds of handiwork, whatever. And for that he was paid milk and a loaf of bread. And my, my memory is serves me right. This was uh, his reward for a week's labor. So it was like however much a liter of milk and a loaf of bread a week, but the stuff was golden. Was your mother, uh, maybe with the help of your grandmother who lived in the rural area, were they able to help you a little bit? Well, I think my mother was uh, an enterprising kind of a person. So it wasn't so much that my mother, grandmother was able to help. Uh, she was hundreds of miles away. Uh, it was a couple of days travel by train just to get where she was. So what my mom did, and a lot of other people did, well, it's black market. But, you know, it's no mafia type of black market, at least not for my mom. Uh, she would take articles of clothing from neighbors, friends, whoever in Warsaw, barter them for uh, foodstuffs uh, in such a way that there would be some left over for our family. And she would take the dangerous journey by train back and forth. During this time, are you aware, <clears throat> aware of the uh, Jewish ghetto in Warsaw? Oh, of course. And what do you think is going on there? 
in retrospect, I think, well, I mean, as far as the Warsaw Ghetto goes, uh, in the early stages, it was almost wishful thinking. Uh, I knew that nothing good was happening to the Jewish people there. But as a kid, I wasn't quite sure what exactly. But over time, it penetrated even my childish mind that the Jewish people somehow are getting killed. And in 1943, it was April, uh, where the much diminished ghetto population rose up in an uprising to fight uh, the oppressors. Well, we knew very well that the fight fighting was going on, and it was in, well, let's see, April into May. And from where we lived, and you, you know, if you see uh, a red glow on the horizon, uh, we could see the, the burning of the ghetto at night. Did you tell me that there was a neighbor across the street who was doing what she could to supply a haven for maybe young Jewish children? Yes, no, that she did. Uh, if I remember correctly, I, know, I remember the boy very distinctly. because He was older than the rest of us kids on the block. But I think there were two little girls, not all that little, because we all played together. And the word in the neighborhood was that these were this lady's cousin's children come to visit Warsaw. Uh, since everybody who lived in that area knew very well that there, was, there were no cousins, uh, everybody knew that these were Jewish kids. I mean, talk about if anybody the risk of somebody being loose mouthed was just tremendous. But okay, the risk didn't apparently didn't materialize. Did you have another neighbor that um, wrote uh, for a underground newspaper? I'm not sure if he wrote or he disseminated them. Well. If he wasn't the originator, he certainly was a member of the underground, and he passed on the bulletins. Uh, my dad used to visit him regularly. I, ever so often, I would catch eavesdrop on my family discussing what was in the bulletin. But, well, that man ended up getting at least wounded and then taken to the famous... Um, Auschwitz? No, no. There was a prison in Warsaw. What's the bird that has this fantastic, uh, beautiful tail? Peacock. Peacock. Okay, the Polish for the prison was Paviak, but if you translate it into English, it's the Peacock prison. Uh, hardly anybody got out of there. Was your dad a member of the underground? That he wasn't. 1944, August? Mm -hmm. What happens then? Well, the home army uh, stages the home army uprising in the city of Warsaw. Home army, Polish soldiers. Right. Um. It's sort of like, if you watch enough movies, uh, you, you probably are familiar with the French resistance. Well, there aren't that many movies about Polish resistance, but it's sort of the same thing. So anyway, the Polish resistance now has decided, okay, 
the Russians are within uh, less than 100 miles of the city, uh, it might be a good idea to get the Germans out of the capital city, and when the war ends, at least the Poles can claim that their own capital has been liberated by their own people, with just a little bit of help from the Russian troops. Expected help from the Russian troops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is a government in exile in England that if this can come to pass, then there would, they would somehow there'd be a way that they could come back and take control, the right, Polish right. government. Okay. Because by, by August 44, uh, most of Poland has already been uh, liberated by the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union is a close distance from Warsaw. The home army is fighting. They're really outmanned, outgunned. They need help, but they won't get it, will they? No, because the Russian armies stop uh, within however many miles outside of the city. And they do start make a push about a month later, but by that time the uprising is pretty well crushed, so it's hard for them to recover. Is there a story that you can share with the audience about four tigers? Here come the tigers. Oh, okay. Uh, see, when the uprising started on August 1, it was it almost sounds like a story, you know, it was a day like any other day, which it was. And for a while, since all the fighting was downtown, uh, we weren't bothered. But we lived at the end of a suburban area. Uh, in my time, there was nothing in front of us anymore, but a pretty good-sized lake, uh, which is probably a slew off the Vistula, but it's big. So if we teach our people here in the U.S. in tornado drills, you know, tornadoes come and get into the bathtub or put as many walls between you as you can, well, the conventional wisdom uh, at that time was if there was any shelling or whatever, uh, put as many walls between you as you can. That is, if you can't get down into the basement. So I do remember the word was passed on real loud, tigers are coming. Well, Tigers was the name for the German tanks. Uh, whether it was the big Tiger tank or whether it was one of the other ones, God knows. But anyway, these tanks were coming. <coughs> so they lined up across the lake from us. And they fired at as many homes as you know, their trajectory would allow. So our home was a quadruplex. Uh, one half and one half with a hallway in the center. Uh, Mom grabbed me and my girlfriend and dragged us into the right-handed bathroom on the first floor. The tank chose to hit the left-hand side of the downstairs. And it's like I told Tom, it took it all out. Uh, the hallway was nothing but a mess. Where the shell came in, one wall was gone. Bathroom fixtures somehow got blown out of the bathroom and were now laying in the hallway. And people who didn't have time to get out of there uh, were killed. But the impact was such that 
the very old detail, my dad and some other guys uh, did the job with shovels. They Let's um, fast forward to a German soldier or soldiers come to your house and they're going to ask you to leave. So, well, okay, the Tigers were fairly early. For a while there was a little bit of peace. We watched the rest of the city keep burning and refugees just pouring out of those neighborhoods that were being overtaken. But eventually, probably the last week of August, uh, we were hit by uh, bomber planes, but those must have been baby bombers. I mean, no, no big American fortress. But anyway, <coughs> so our neighborhood got bombed. Uh, the bomb that landed in our backyard was a dud. Uh, the other two found their targets. One made an awful hole in the street. The other one hit a shelter. So again, it was one of those things, but since it was a dirt shelter and nobody had to worry too much about doing much bearing, it was already done by the bomb. Well. I'm not sure how soon after that, a day, that's fuzzy in my mind, but uh, we could hear a voice saying, you know, knocking on the basement door, get out, get out, get out. So of course we all did. And it was one of those things where you're expecting a disaster, you, you take precautions, so my mom had a suitcase with food and some clothing and whatever. Not a big suitcase, but anyway, buried in the peony bushes. Well, there is this soldier with his gun pointed on the door 